Hello and welcome to the screencast on using R to uh, looking at R functions for basic probability uh, tools and probability functions distributions. Um, we will be using a little bit of data. Let me clear this out. We'll be using a little bit of data today, but only once or twice uh, for the screencast. Uh, so we'll just call the same data that we have before, uh, grabbing it from Dryad. So first, I just want to make it clear that uh, R, of course, has many of the basic functions we need for both probability distributions themselves and for basic things that one uses in probability theory. So computing factorials, uh, computing the gamma function, this is not the gamma distribution or the beta function, not the distribution, uh, and of course things like n choose k, how many you know, when we're looking at. All of those functions are of course available. What we're most interested in though for, for purposes of our class is we'll be looking at uh, many different uh, families of distributions like normal distribution, binomial, gamma, negative binomial, Poisson will probably be the ones we work with most. Um, and we need tools from them. And there's particular tools that we're going to need. And for R, for any given distribution, we generally have four different functions, which are the density, probability, quantile, and random number generating functions. So D, P, Q, and R, which are demonstrated here for the normal distributions. These would be the names of the functions. So let's go through those. First, let's go through the density function. So this is d-norm. So if you want to look at the height of the density function uh, for any particular value, you would use this d-norm function. And for discrete ones, instead of giving you the height uh, of that distribution, uh, um, it actually gives you the probability for that particular value. Um, and again, this is uh, conditioned upon a particular set of parameters for that distribution. So for instance, if we wanted to know the height of that density function, which is going to sort of, we can think about it as approximating the probability, not at that exact point, but near that point, the area under that curve at that, near, near that point, um, for a uh, normal distribution that has a mean equal to zero and standard deviation equal to one, we just go uh, denorm for zero with the parameter for that normal distribution. So in this case, we get a value of 0 0.3989, and we'll come back to what that really means because um, obviously for a continuous distribution, the uh, probability has to be equal to zero at any given point. So how this is computing it is somewhat important. Um, and like all our functions, we can shorten that. If we do put the arguments for a function in order, we don't have to specify the names of the arguments. So this will give us the same answer. Okay, so not surprisingly, if the mean of the distribution we're looking at, the mean is zero and standard deviation is one, if instead of looking at zero, which is going to be right where the mean is, we look a little bit to the right of that at, at point two, we expect this to be a lower value. And indeed, we see it's considerably low because we're further down. It's a little bit easier to think about all this by actually plotting things out. And we can actually plot these density functions quite easily. So we're basically going to specify denorm just like we did before, but we're going to use it in the context of the curve function. So our first argument in the curve function uh, when we're doing it for these densities is that density itself, we do have to specify sort of the beginning and end point. So we're going to plot from negative 5 all the way through 10. And so we can do this for two different distributions, one normal with a mean of 0 and standard deviation 1, one with a mean of 5, standard deviation of 1.5. We plot them, and voila, we get them. And we can see these approximate heights, that, that point uh, 3, 9 at 0 corresponds to that point that we talked about just above. All right. However, often we're not just interested in that particular point, although as you will see when we do uh, fit maximum likelihood and, and Bayesian, that those, that those values become quite useful to us. Often we're interested in, in some aspect of cumulative probability, pro, uh, probability for, uh, for distribution up to and including that particular value. Um, so what we can actually do is use another function, which is called the p-norm, the probability function. So this will actually give us the uh, probability distribution up to including, and you can specify whether you're starting at the lower tail or the upper tail. So for instance, here if we go for the, uh, the normal distribution, again with the, um, the distribution we're looking at is mean of zero, standard deviation one of a normal. And we want to know for everything up to and including um, p uh, norm of, of uh, equals to two, we do that, and what that basically tells us is that, yes, when you go up to and including 2 on this distribution, again, it's the same distribution up to about 2, the area under this curve from here all the way to the left, here that's about 90, 
97% of the area, or almost 98% of the area. And then we can flip that tail um, and just see what's on the other side of it. So this is about two, two and a quarter percent, or you know, two and a quarter percent of the area in this particular case. Okay, and you actually use this all in time uh, implicitly whenever you're figuring out a p-value. So let's just run a very simple model where we're fitting sex com teeth as a function of genotype, and then just look at the ANOVA. And um, what do we see from here? Well, we've got an f value of 50.316 uh, in our model. We know that's going to be an f distribution, so we call pf. We calculate the degrees of freedom. Here they are. Our degrees of freedom are 1 and 1916. So we put 1 and 1916. And we're interested, of course, in the lower tail equals false, because we're interested in how extreme or more extreme. We're just, if we did an f distribution, we were just interested in what would be over on this tail. This is a normal distribution instead of an f plotted, but hopefully you get that idea. And if we do that and run it, we get this incredibly small value, and that's the, the p value, and that should be almost identical, if not exactly identical, numerically to what we see here 1.834 times 10 to the negative 12. 1.834 times 10 to the negative 12 here and here. And that's essentially what that, that p value is doing. We can also use this, and it's quite useful, when we have to calculate the probability in a particular interv interval for a continuous probability distribution. So for instance, if you want to calculate the probability of observing a value, say, between 10 and 15 for a normal distribution, uh, and that normal distribution has a mean of 10, and the standard deviation of 3.3, we literally can calculate p-norm uh, from, um, from 15 to 10, given that distribution. Of course, these two have to stay the same, because that's the distribution. And then we're saying from 15 to 10, we can calculate it. And that gives us essentially that area under that curve for that region. And you can sort of think about it. This way of sort of thinking about it in terms of that cumulative distribution function. Um, and what I'm plotting here is in black is just the normal we looked at before, and in red is just that the p norm, essentially the cumulative distribution that we're looking at. Of course, the inverse of, of this uh, is instead of trying to compute these uh, quantities, we can, we can start with the probability and say at what value do we see that particular quantity. So if we want a value, uh, probability of 0.95, where does it lie on this curve? So, you know, we know before that at, what was it, 2 we looked at? It was here, that, that the area from here on in, a value of 2 was about 0.97. So here, if we look at it for a Q norm of 0.95, we know it's going to be a little bit less than, point, uh, than 2. Again, this is a normal distribution with mean 0, standard deviation of 1. And we're saying we want to look at... Um, figure out the value associated with 95% of the area under that curve, starting on the left. Now we do it, and you already see the answer here, but we'll just run it anyways, and it's 1.644. So that's saying if we found 1.644, which is approximately here, that if you go from here to the left, that's 95% of the area under the curve. And we should, of course, be able to just reverse this by putting that 1.64 uh, into p-norm, and we recover 0.95. So you can see how these, um, we can go back and forth between these two. So we can think about this from a p-value centric point of view if we so cared. If we wanted to have an alpha of 0.05 for a particular f distribution with uh, a particular um, degrees of freedom, so let's say the numerator degrees of freedom equal to 1 and the denominator degrees of freedom was 49, you can ask what the f-value threshold would be. So what number do we need to exceed to demonstrate that we would need uh, data, you know, this extreme or more to, to get, get this p-value? And then we can fit that in. So again, qf, because we're looking at the quantile, specifying that the alpha is going to be um, 0.05, so our p is 0.95. We can, of course, switch this by making this 0.05 and change this lower tail to equal to false. Um, degrees of freedom equal 1. Uh, for the numerator, degrees of freedom for the numerator, uh, denominator equals 49, numerator is 1. If I said that backwards, I apologize. And then we run that, and we get a value of 4.03. So for an F statistic, we could reject the null, uh, 
if we so choose and cared about p-values, if we had an f-value that exceeded 4.03, which is this number down here. So of course the main utility of such distributions, or at least the immediately uh, main use of these, is for looking at potentially extreme values compared to some theoretical distribution. And uh, they're useful for comparing observed versus predicted values from distributions of uh, test statistics. However, and we're going to use this a whole lot, at least in my mind, the most useful functions are those that generate random numbers based on particular distributions. Because these are very useful for generating simulations, for power analysis, and even for, uh, for our Bayesian uh, methods for MCMC. It's very important to be able to generate random numbers effectively and easily. I don't know enough about computers to, to understand this, but as I understand it, Computers don't produce truly random numbers. These are pseudo-random numbers, but for our purposes, they will work okay. Um, we can set seeds to replicate the same results, but let's not worry about that for the moment. Um, so what we will do is we're just going to do a new plot. And here, we're going to use the R norm, so we're going to generate random, we're going to generate random numbers from a normal distribution. This 500 means we're going to generate 500 random numbers from a distribution with a mean zero and a standard deviation equal to one. So we do that, and we can plot the histogram, and we can plot the curve. And here I want to make the point that this curve, this red curve, is the theoretical normal distribution with a mean zero and standard deviation of one, and the histogram errors are simulated data so from that distribution to give us an idea that, yes, indeed, we seem to be doing a reasonable job of doing that simulation. So we'll skip this part, because that's from the uh, lecture that we haven't gone through yet. But uh, this is basically one way of creating a, a, a simple boundary, uh, which is using an if-else statement. So I'll let you do that on your own. Um, get rid of that. Um, and we can ask ourselves a couple of questions. We can use this to sort of take a look at what various, um, say, bimodal normal distributions might look like uh, together uh, when, when you only can estimate don't realize that there's two separate groups, for instance. So for instance, here's a very extreme one. We have two separate distributions, black and red. And if we just, if we didn't realize we had these two groupings, we might just do a distribution of, of uh, all of them together and we'd get this clear bimodality. Well, that's clear. We would know something's going on here. Of course, if we change it, these normals from, say, 5 to 8 to 5 and 6 and replot that, we're going to see a very different picture Oh, well, it's going to be just squishing it back in, so it won't... Ah, I've got to change this. My bad. Let's do that again. Right? So we plot them together, and it becomes very difficult to actually see that there's two normal distributions that are separated a bit. And that's a useful thing to sort of, when you're not sure what's going on, is to draw some simulations and plot some curves to give yourself a better intuition of, you know, when might you be able to see something, when might you miss it entirely. We can also use this for some other things, like saying, all right, let's look at our t-distribution. Uh, what happens for our t-distribution as sample size increases, which is, of course, very important for thinking about the t-statistic. And we can plot those on top of each other and look how they change, in particular in the tails, uh, and how those t-distributions uh, um, start approximating the, the z-distribution as, as sample size increases. Okay. So there's a couple of ways of specifying these, uh, of, of simulating numbers that are worth considering. So for instance, let's say we started with a sequence of numbers from 1 to 100. One thing we could do is we're going to first of all use the set seed, and that's just so that we can produce the same set of random numbers each time. One thing we can do is basically say, let's use each value of x, and on to each value of x, uh, we're going to produce 100 new uh, random variables, and those are going to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of, or variance of three. If you don't specify, I should say, in our norm, it'll default to the variance, I believe, but please double check that. So we run that. We're going to get some set of random numbers, and we can look at those, and here we are, 100 random numbers of increasing length, not surprisingly. Um, another way of doing this same thing, though, and this is generally considered a, a better form, we're going to use the same seed is instead of specifying um, x outside of here and specify the mean, we actually have as our mean those particular values of x. And that's the only thing we change. So instead of having x plus our norm 
with the mean in the R norm set to zero, here we just have to specify x directly in it. And this is considered the vectorized approach to this. Um, they both actually, I think, vectorized computations, um, and this should produce identical results. We can just check any one of them since these are around 98.579, 98.579, great. Um, so in general, you'll see me writing it like this most of the time in class. Um, and you can read on about what's going on differently. I don't think I need to plot those. All right. So I do want to show you a few more short things. So first off, let's take a quick look at what happens when we look at a Poisson distribution with a particular lambda. We'll say lambda is 11, which is pretty close to the mean of sex comb teeth, which we might want to consider Poisson distributed. And we're going to plot the curve of the lambda distribution from 0 to 20. And let's look at that curve. And we get this wild thing on the bottom here, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Why do we get this? Because, of course, this is a discrete distribution. And so it has zero probability of being any non-discrete value, or not the probability, but the probability for a particular number can only be true for an, a whole number. Um, for for um, you know, 11.5, it's a meaningless concept. So keep in mind when you're doing these plots what, what you might be plotting. Yes, it can plot it. Is it a meaningful plot? It may look cool, but it doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, so we could instead plot something like this, which might be a little bit clearer. Either of these might be a better way of, of doing this plot um, when using the bar plot function down here, which you can sort of consider as a pseudo histogram, although these are not really histograms, these are probability, or just using these lines. So either of these would work. And the difference here is here we're, in the first case, we're using the plot function and just doing type equals h, which is for a histogram, it's a sort of pseudo histogram. And here we're just directly doing the bar plot, which is my personal preference because it's a lot nicer looking. Um, Okay, uh, I think I'll actually pause the, this here and we'll continue on in a second with a new screencast.